Welcome to the History of Psychology show. I'm your host, Christopher Green, from York University in Toronto, Canada. The purpose of the show is to interview working historians of psychology, not only about their current research, although I'll certainly be doing that, but also a bit about their backgrounds, their careers, and their views of the discipline as a whole. For episode two, I have the director of the Cummings Center for the History of Psychology, Kathy Fay. I have known Kathy for a long time. Indeed, I should confess right up front that Kathy was a graduate student of mine back in the mists of time. And if you're worried after the first episode that I will only be interviewing friends of mine, please bear with me. Um, I haven't done this job since uh, my old This Week in the History of Psychology podcast series 14 years ago. And so I'm using some people I know to help me warm up the old interview engine. Um, I will be spreading out to guests outside of my immediate circle uh, in uh, soon enough. Anyway, since the time that Kathy was at York University, she has carved out an important place for herself in the discipline. She has served as president of the Society for the History of Psychology. That's the history division of the American Psychological Association. Um, and before that, she served as the division's representative to the APA's governing council. She started as the assistant director of the Cummings Center around a decade ago before she had even completed her PhD. And just last year, with the retirement of the longtime former director, David Baker, she became just the third director in the center's history. If you haven't heard of the Cummings Center before, it is located at the University of Akron in Eastern Ohio. Over the 50 plus years of its existence, it has become the heart and soul of archival research into American psychology's past. It is not only home to the archives of the history of American psychology, which holds collections of hundreds of psychologists, but it also has one of the largest collections of historical psychological equipment, film and audio recordings anywhere. The center also includes a fascinating Institute for Human Science and Culture, which houses the Oak Native American Ethnographic Collection. And more recently, it has opened a National Museum of Psychology at which are displayed objects from some of psychology's most notable studies. For instance, Stanley Milgram's shock machine and a door with a barred window from Philip Zimbardo's prison experiment. I'll leave it to Kathy to tell you more. So, Kathy Fay, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Chris. Um, I've noticed that I've, I have sort of had to stand in line um, getting you on the podcast. You were on APA's uh, Speaking of Psychology a few weeks ago, yeah? Talking about the yeah. summer? Yeah, so during the pandemic, I started this uh, sort, of, sort of rapid response collecting project, and APA um, was interested in that. Basically, I've been talking to psychologists about their experiences with the pandemic and sort of with the movement for social justice over this past year, um, which is how I think I caught the eye of APA. Um, so they touched base with me about that as well as um, just to talk about the center and what's been going on there. So that was that was really good. We've actually had some interesting stuff come out of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Do you have an interesting finding that you can tease us with or? Uh, with the oral history project? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I think the thing that I actually found most interesting was not a finding yet so so far as much as um, something I found with that that project as well as in my everyday job is that nobody thinks they're important enough to be part of history. Um, so everybody sort of has this idea that your paper shouldn't be in an archive, you shouldn't be part of an oral history project unless you know you're Milgram or Zimbardo or Elizabeth Loftus. Um, so I've, I've been really interested <laughs> to sort of see how what people think is worthy of uh, being saved in the historical record through that. that, that that's interesting. I was interviewed for that project myself. And, and I think the first thing I said was, well, I don't know whether you want to hear what I have to say, but I'll do it if you want. And you were very enthusiastic and encouraged me to do it. So I did. Yeah, that's exactly what everybody says. It's <laughs> The first response, either by email or, or as, as maybe you'll see eventually on the video uh, recordings as well. So that's been kind of interesting. Um, yeah. But yeah, psychologists are, are doing about as well as everybody else. You know, some people are doing just fine through all of this and other people are um, having a hard time through all of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you were on another podcast um, just this week with the week that we're recording this. This will come out in a couple of weeks. Um, which was about uh, misinformation during the pandemic. Is that right? Yeah, it's been really interesting. At the start of the pandemic, um, you know, I really, in my everyday 
life. I don't have a lot of time for re for research and writing. I just, I don't have time for that anymore as much as I'd like to anyway. And at the start of the pandemic, it actually felt like I had about a month breather um, because I think everybody thought it was going to be over pretty quick. So people weren't working so frantically. They were all just sort of taking a break, which meant that I had some room to, to research and write. So when I was in graduate school, the first article I ever published with you, actually, I, I wrote it as a practicum paper for one of your courses, was a, a historical art article on the psychology of rumor mm -hmm. and looking at rumor during World War II. And uh, as I started to listen to the news early on in the pandemic, the, the notion of rumor started coming up again and again on the radio and in the newspaper and all this kind of stuff. And people started talking about the war on rumor during the pandemic and things like this. And the similarities between that and the stuff that I had seen happening during World War II um, were just, I couldn't leave it alone, right? <laughs> I had to write something about this. Um, and Evan Nesterick at, um, I'm probably going to mess up the name of the magazine. It's called, I think it's called the, uh, the Behavioral Scientist magazine, which I actually really love. He had contacted me and said, do you know anyone who's doing anything that we could publish historically related to the pandemic? And I said, well, I have something I could write. So anyway, so I spent like about a week writing this magazine article and it kind of blew up. And I've been on about five different podcasts related yeah. to uh, rumor and uh, misinformation during the pandemic. It's been interesting because um, I always feel like kind of, I have to add that caveat. I'm like, I'm not a expert on misinformation or fake news or any of this. I said, I can tell you about parallels between what's happening now and what has happened in previous crises. Um, and people are, seem, seem quite content with that. So, so I think that was about, it was probably about the fifth podcast I've done on, on rumor and misinformation, just this little project that I took up for fun at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, that podcast was, I think it was called, um, it's called the RP Healthcast, and it's uh, run by a fellow named Jeffrey Friedman out of a company called uh, Rooney Productions in New York City. Um, so it, yeah, it was, it's been kind of uh, interesting. It's, it's probably the first time I've had to kind of do, you know, I, I talk to the media a lot, but it's really, it's about the center. And I'm very comfortable with that. And this has been different. This has been um, a bit more of an, um, it always feels a bit like a negotiation because I've realized how much people want you to say things. Mm -hmm. These podcasts, because mis misinformation and rumor are very political right now. Right. I mean, they always are, but right now they really are. And uh, so it's been kind of, I don't know, it's been a bit of a life lesson to sort of make my way through this, yeah. how to take yeah. part in these podcasts without saying saying things that I, I don't believe or don't feel qualified to say. Oh, so you feel like there's a bit of pressure on you to go a certain way, uh, depending on the Yeah, well, Yeah, and and, it, and it's interesting because it's not even necessarily that uh, they aren't things I believe, but they're things that I don't think my my research on the history of rumor qualify me to say. Right. Right. <laughs> so it's not that our, our political beliefs are different. It's just that I don't feel like that can be connected to, to that piece of scholarship. You know what I mean? So, so, so just between us two historians then, um, <laughs> what are the key parallels you found between what was going on uh, during World War II's attempts to squelch rumor and what's going on now? Uh, it's really interesting because basically, this was the other reason I ended up writing that article is, the, is when the, center, the uh, CDC set up a rumor website or a rumor page on their website. Um, and basically their approach to quelling rumor was to print rumors in bold print and then print the fact underneath it. And this is exactly what psychologists and others were doing during World War II, except in the newspaper instead of on the internet. Um, and which is really interesting because one of the things that they found in, 19, in the 1940s was that that's a pretty terrible idea. Tends to reinforce um, the rumor. Right, people don't make it past the bold print. They read the bold print and sometimes they don't read what's under it. Or there, this is debated now in the contemporary research, but there's some evidence that shows that even if you refute a rumor, have, just having seen it again, like even if they do read the refutation of the rumor, just having seen the rumor again, people are more likely to believe it. Yeah. Um, but interesting because the CDC, the Department of Defense, um, FEMA, all these different, the World Health Organization, um, Johns Hopkins University, all these different organizations have a page like this. And uh, it's just, 
it's really interesting to me that 60 years later, we're doing the exact same thing. So there's that. And then um, a lot of the, the things that were just, just sort of the tone of, of the way in which the government is speaking about rumor and like making it almost like a patriotic act to not spread rumor, to not spread misinformation is, mm-hmm. is really similar. Just the feel of it feels um, very similar to the kinds of patriotic sort of social responsibility things that were spreading around in World War II. So yeah, it's just been really interesting. And there's a psychologist, a Canadian psychologist, I think he's in Alberta, wrote a, a book on uh, the psychology of pandemics. This guy couldn't have had better timing. I think he started it probably the year before, you know, or he's, I don't know when he started writing it, but it got published right before the pandemic. Really? So crazy. Um, he actually goes through all the same, he's using the the same sort of psychological analysis of rumor that Gordon Allport and Robert Knapp were using in World War II. So he talks about the rumor formula, which was created by Allport and Knapp. Um, he talks about sort of the psychological functions of rumor. So why we spread rumors and the types that we spread. Uh, all of that is taken directly from the 1940s from Allport and Knapp. So it's just having a bit of a day again, um, yeah. even though no one knows about what was going on in the 1940s. To it. Um, so, of course, life for academics has been kind of unusual, uh, like it has been for everybody o- over the last, uh, what it's been now, nine months, 10 months. Um, are you teaching this year? Yeah, I was actually set to teach my first in-person graduate class this year, which I was really excited about. Um, I've taught, prior to this, I've taught an online history of psychology class every year at the undergraduate level. Um, and it's a summer class, so it's eight weeks long. Um, it's a tough it's a tough one to teach because it's very quick paced. It's completely asynchronous, um, you know. So, so I like that class. I like that we get to expose so many people to history of psych through that class. But I've really been looking forward to uh, teaching the graduate history of psych class. I've taught grad history of psych once before, but that too was online. This was was going to be a first for me. Our university um, gave us the go-ahead to teach in person, and our department was encouraging us to teach in person. So I my class was six students. I was set to teach it in person, and then I sent out an email to those six students and asked them what they wanted to do. And three of them wanted to, to meet in person, and three of them did not. So it seems really silly to have three of us in a room on computers talking to three people at home. Yeah. So, so, and you know, all of that seemed fine to me. So I just moved the whole thing online. Um, You had a lot more experience being online than the rest of us when all this started, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, but not, I mean, everything, the whole thing was just such a new experience for me because, I've never led a graduate level discussion in person. The class went great, you know, I taught and taught the whole thing synchronously online, um, but I have nothing to compare it to. Yeah, did um, they participate the way you expect in a graduate seminar for them to participate or? Everybody participated and the discussions were good, but there was some enthusiasm missing that I might be wrong, but I feel like when I finally get in the classroom, there'll be more of that. Little things that I, I realize I like to do in person, even when I taught in person at the undergraduate level, I, I use bl- a blackboard a lot or a whiteboard, you know. Um, so f- so in this class, for example, one of the activities we did virtually was I gave them a li- and this is an activity I stole from you, actually, now that I think about it. I gave them an archival letter and uh, it was a letter by uh, Henry written by Henry Goddard. And this was like the second day of class. So they have no context for anything. Give them this letter and there's, you know, there's names and places and dates and stuff. And and their task is to sort of go away and figure out what's happening in this letter. And then I ask each of them to find an article or two, you know, that tells us something more about the story that can be by this letter. And it was interesting because I realized like in a a classroom, what I would do is, is we would gather all this information on a whiteboard. And I don't know why that feels so important, but it did. It's almost like you can start to see the story coming together. Um, And I know there's apps for this and I tried some of those, but it changed everything because then I couldn't see their faces and they all got freaked out when they started seeing it going up on this virtual whiteboard. Right. It made it too formal. It was no longer a brainstorming activity. It was like we were writing a formal paper or something. So 
I, there were some things about online teaching that were complicated for me that are just silly, small things, but changed the feel of the class where we were just figuring things out together. Yeah. Um, but all that said, it was awesome. I, I don't know. It was just so much better than teaching undergrad. Yeah. Um, I like teaching undergrad, but sometimes I always feel like I want to take about 10 steps back and just spend the whole class like talking with them about how to write and how to make it, what makes an argument an argument, um, critical thinking skills, you know, all of that. Whereas with the graduate students, it was almost like we could mostly skip all that stuff and go straight to thinking about critical thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, you know, that project's a really interesting project. I think we have a lot of uh, teachers of history of psychology listening to this. And the version of that letter exercise that I did involved a letter from I think it was James McKean Cattell writing to this philosopher, his colleague in the Columbia philosophy department about some journal that he was talking about putting together, but it was all very vague. So when you analyze what's going on in that letter, it turns out to be the beginnings of uh, what, what they call the journal of philosophy, psychology, and scientific methods. Now it's just known as the journal of philosophy. It's only a philosophy journal. Um, but and there are a couple of articles about that whole process, how that happened. And it, it, I, I find it a really interesting exercise. I'm glad to see that you've, uh, I'm interested to hear that you've, you've used it as well and you find it useful. It's sort of, but they start off with this bit of archival material, which is so unusual in, in the kinds of history of courses that we teach in psychology, they tend to be so textbook based, um, but real historians spend all their time in the archives, so. Yeah, and it's it's um, they it's the only way I feel like they can really get a sense of what it, what you do as a historian. Yeah. Right? So, uh, even later, it, whether they're writing papers or not writing papers, they go away from this and read journal articles and understand how those things were constructed. I think the other really important part of that that activity, and I'll probably do more of those. I'll do more than one letter in the future because it was the best part of the class for sure. Is uh, they start to realize all the layers of history, right? So I, I think the letter that you assigned to us as graduate students was not the one you're talking about. Okay. Um, the thing that I remember the most from, it, I feel like it was a letter from William James to somebody. And I feel like somehow it involved um, the big California earthquake. Oh yeah, he writes a little account. There's a little sort of autobiographical account of his day that morning when the earthquake hit at, at, when he's at Stanford at the time. That's right. Yeah, because I, I remember um, feeling when I when I read that, uh, or realizing when I read that that you know how important it's not it's not just intellectual history, right? That's kind of what I walked away from that with. It's like you don't just need to know the people and the places and the ideas. The ideas were where I had always been focused. Right? It's like wow, there's this whole world going on around these psychologists right. that seeps in in all these various ways. Um, and that's kind of the same thing that, that I, I'm trying to do with these letter projects is to help them see that uh, um, it's more than ideas. Because I think sometimes with psychology students particularly, so you're teaching history of psychology to, to psychologists to be, uh, they understand ideas. And sometimes when they write a paper, they write a paper like, a, like they would a lit review of research. You know, they're writing as though they're writing their dissertation and they're reviewing all the research that there's ever been on post-traumatic stress disorder, which is not what a historical paper is, right? So I feel like when they get this, this archival project where they look at a letter, they start to see, oh, there's social context and they were answering real problems in the social world and they were people with biographies and lives and all this other stuff, which then helps them make that shift. Yeah. From a lit review to writing a history. Yeah, that's exactly the distinction. There's a lot of people who seem to mistake history for lit reviews, like this march of theories. But often when historical figures write about theories or write about ideas, they're kind of tacitly responding to something that's going on in the world around them, but they don't always like name it. I, I, the recent example that I try and use, although it's now slipping into the past, I'm going to have to come up with a new one, is after 9-11, there's a whole bunch of research on terrorism and on emergencies and, and all this stuff. And, and they don't necessarily reference 9-11. You have to know that that's what was going on. And that's why suddenly there's this spike in that kind of research in the early 21st century. Um, uh, especially a few years after when everybody knows a huge amount about it. They don't talk about the event that precipitated all of this. They just all know. 
and you know there's no need to excuse why you are talking about this topic but 50 years later or 100 years later it may be kind of seem kind of odd if you aren't aware of the the history around them the the social and political context around them right and that's exactly this letter that i give them I can't remember now who Goddard is writing to. It's one of these, it's, it's some official in New York City who has a lot of money. Um, yeah. Is this when he's doing the, he does this, this intelligence test project of all the New York school system? Is it about that? No, it's basically he's trying to, uh, he's talking about Letchworth Village. And he's trying to say what we need to do is, is um, a lot more work, put a lot more money into preventing feeble-mindedness rather than trying to create a whole bunch of places to house the feeble-minded. Um, and he's also saying in, in this letter, I can't remember if it's directly or indirectly, but he's basically saying, we also just need to keep the feeble-minded out of the country. And so when when they when the students read this letter, they don't know about sort of the immigration background of this, right? They don't know about, uh, they don't know what Letchworth Village is. They have to go look that up. Um, they have to look up Vineland, the school in Vineland, all of this kind of stuff. Tell us what Letchworth Village is. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, Letchworth basically was a space for housing the feeble-minded, and the idea was really about um, treatment of the feeble-minded and sort of assessment of the feeble-minded and all of these kinds of things. Um, and, and Goddard is basically, in a roundabout way, you know, and, and a couple of the students pick this up, he's trying to get money to support his assessment of feeble-mindedness is what he's trying to do, and, and to convince people that that's where, where federal funds should be placed. So. They do this research, and it's it's interesting to me because each of them picks up a different uh, corner of it, right? Like somebody became very interested in in whoever the the guy from New York City was that Letch, that um, Goddard is writing to. Somebody else kind of skipped over all that and went, "Who who were the patients? Who were the people who were being held in these facilities, right? Or who were the clients, whatever you want to call them?" And so everybody kind of goes into their own corner of it. And then when you come together, everybody, especially because they go read a journal article, so and, you know, they kind of get interested. And a number of them then want to write their paper on these topics, which I like. Um, but, you know, you kind of see that there's all these different places in that history that you can go and that you can explore. So it's good. And I kind of, in the long run, I think what I'd like to do is start every chapter like that, if I could find enough um, good yeah. archival that would be really interesting. So, yeah, and I, th I think it would be good too to sort of, I'd love to see a textbook like this, right? Or something where, um, this is where I think we, we can talk about this later maybe, but I think this is where we need to go next is just the textbooks that we have for teaching undergrad and grad history are just, uh, they're not bad, they're just outdated. And I think that this is they, the kind of thing that- They produce history as a content rather than as the process that produces that content. Um, you know, Ludy Benjamin, you must know, the Ludy Benjamin had this book, I don't think it's in print anymore, that was called The History of Psychology and Letters. And it mm -hmm. printed, I don't know, reprinted 100 letters or something like that. And you could pull letters out of that um, and maybe, uh, you know, produce a textbook around those letters. Yeah, and we're, tr we're trying to do some of this at the archives now, you know, during in the early stages of, of the pandemic, our reference archivist Lizette Barton um, started this series that she was calling pandemic projects because uh, everybody was trying to teach from home. So she would just take a random letter out of the archives and then sort of try to guide people through doing um, kind of a document analysis of that of that letter. But I think if it can be, I think those letters connected to the content that you're actually going to teach at some point in the course, that's a better link. Yeah. That's why I think it would be nice to have it kind of packaged in some way with with whatever the content going forward is going to be. That sounds great. We should do that. <laughs> yeah, I agree. We just um, need some. <laughs> <laughs> just need someone to publish it to find, find right. it. Um, so uh, th th that's a lot about teaching, much more than I expected we'd talk about. That's really interesting. So let's talk about the Cummings Center. Um, tell our listeners about it. You've got like three main divisions, the, the archives and this Institute for uh, Human Science and Culture and the new Me National Museum of Psychology. Tell us about those things. Yeah, so uh, most people know about the origins of the center, but we started out uh, as the Archives of the History of American Psychology in 1965. And that is our oldest unit. So, so the archives was started by a couple of psychologists here at the University of Akron. 
who basically realized that no one was collecting the historical record of psychology. Um, I think about that and to me it's kind of amazing because it, an archive is completely devoted to psychology is an odd thing. I still think it's an odd thing, even though I've, I've been here for 11 years now. Every time I try to like explain to somebody what I do for a living, I'm reminded that it's a little bit strange that there's a whole archives and a whole museum devoted to psychology's history. Um, but the archives uh, is really, I think, the largest collection of its kind that focuses solely on psychology and its history. So we have about... Um, best guess right now, 4,000 linear feet of material that document psychology's history. So a linear foot is about the size of a banker's box, standard moving box. Mm -hmm. It's probably more than that uh, if you count kind of all the apparatus and things. Those are boxes that are mostly filled with documents for people who do not spend their time on archives, right? Their letters, their diaries, their drafts, their stuff like that. Yeah. So the kind of thing you're going to find in an archive is basically um, unpublished material, things you aren't going to find in libraries. So we don't collect a lot. We do have books, but we don't collect that many books anymore. Uh, we don't collect journals, really. Anything that's published is not, not really part of our collection. It's more things like, if you consider the paper trail of your life as a psychologist, um, paper, well, digital trail now, perhaps more so, uh, but every email you write, every letter you write, uh, every early draft of an article that you scribble on and scratch out or you know, now do track changes on. The paper trail of your life is basically um, what you'll find in a personal manuscript collection in an archives. And uh, now also that would include anything like photographs, film, apparatus you use in your laboratory. Um, and not just, your, not just a professional career, right? But one of the things one of the things I find when people want to donate their collections to us is they have a tendency to want to take the personal stuff out and not because they're private about it. So uh, for example, if you kept a diary, uh, a lot of people would be like, well, I'll just take that out. It's not relevant to my career. Um, it absolutely is. And it's, you know, when people want to write a history of somebody, somebody's life or work, they're not just interested in their professional personage. It's also their, their personal lives. So uh, all of those kinds of things is what you would find in an archival collection. So okay. we've, we've been collecting now, you know, that's, that's a lot of years of collecting. Who are some um, of the most prominent psychologists whose uh, pe paper collections you have? I would say probably the most uh, famous collection and the one that gets the most use are the Abraham Maslow papers. Um, you know, everybody's interested in Abraham Maslow. And it's actually a really fantastic collection. There, one of the things that Maslow did that I love is he um, kept, it, when he was in college, he kept a record of every single book he ever read and kept little notes about every book he ever read. And that booklet exists in our collection. So if you ever want, I mean, what better way to understand how Maslow developed his ideas than to see every single book he ever read? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, things like that, you're just not going to get that in a library or in any other kind of way. Um, but that collection <clears throat> is so popular that our reference archivist, when she gets a request to see some portion of that collection, she always throws her hands up in the air and says, Maslow Schmaslow. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of our more famous collections. My, what, the collection that I love is um, uh, the Spissy Papers, Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues. So SPICI was founded in 1936 as an organization that was really going to focus on the intersection of psychology and social issues. And I love that collection because um, there's just so much opportunity in it, so many topics to explore because SPICI was always sort of keeping with the times. Uh, so, you know, during World War II, they were really focused on the study of morale. Um, after World War II, you'll see a lot of stuff in the collection about peace uh, and moving into the Cold War. You'll start to see a lot of stuff around peace, 1960s, women's issues, um, race issues, all this kind of stuff. So it's, it's just, it's got so much history in it. Um, and as somebody who, you know, I think of our collections a little bit differently than researchers do, because I'm interested in how we can use them to um, create exhibits that are gonna engage the public. Mm -hmm. And one of the best ways to do that is to find something the public already knows about or understands like World War II or 
you know, the civil rights movement and connect that to psychology. And Spissy gives me a million opportunities to do that. So I think that's a real gem in our collections or yeah. see papers. But it's not all just papers. You also have equipment and all kinds of objects that are not papers. Tell us about some of the interesting stuff you've got that, that isn't just documents. Yeah, our most popular objects. We've got about, again, I'm estimating, but I think it's about at this point 1,400 objects from the history of psychology. The most famous ones are the simulated shock generator from Milgram's uh, studies of obedience and some of the materials like the prison door from the Stanford prison experiment. Um, it's interesting, the Milgram shock generator was uh, given to us by Milgram's wife. Um, so Yale had his papers and Alexander Milgram, his wife, wanted to give them the shock generator as well, but they are in archives. And so they were like, we don't take objects. Really? And which is true of most archives. They're, they don't take artifacts. And this is how we end up. Same with the Stanford prison experiment. A lot of Phil Zimbardo's papers are, are not here. A lot of the stuff around the, the experiment is, but those artifacts are here because archives don't take objects. And we were not gonna turn down those objects. Um, and this is in some ways how we started collecting is that other, other archives just simply wouldn't take these objects, but they're huge pieces of history, right? Oh, yeah. Um, so that's how we ended up with so many artifacts. Uh, really the thing that is best represented in our collections are sort of the, it's the brass and glass era of psychology. So it's also one of the most challenging things just in terms of public understanding of psychology. So we do exhibits on, on things like, you know, chemographs and um, tone variators and all these kinds of things that were used to test sensation and perception um, early on. And, and they're very difficult for the public to grasp, right? And they also have a really hard time understanding how, uh, you know, testing whether someone can tell the difference between two weights is psychology. Mm -hmm. We put a lot of effort into doing that because we can't not tell that story. It's such, it's so integral to what psychology is and where it came from that we always try to tell that story and we have so many objects to do it and they're beautiful. Right? You know a bunch of partial hip chronoscopes as I recall. We do, yeah, we we have, I, I think we did actually kind of do a count when we were creating the museum because we were trying to find sort of the best ones to put on display. So I think we have about six or seven hip scopes and then a number of boxes that are just pieces and parts. Um, there could be anybody else in the world who has six hip chronoscopes. Yeah and it, it's interesting too we really um, we take most of them as long as they're even slightly different from from uh, one we already have because it shows the progression of how chronoscopes changed over time right with a huge part of the history of psychology and we keep parts because if we get duplicates and we want to make them work again, we need to be able to sort of have all these pieces and parts. Um, so our, our basement is a strange place full of, um, I mean, there's so many artifacts down there that I, I can't even identify. And one of the things I love to do is when, um, you know, when we're actually open to the public, we'll take people down on behind the scenes tours and I'll take them through our lower level of the building where those artifacts are stored. And every artifact has an image of it on the box that it's stored in. And I'll be take, I'll take a psychologist down there. It's not a historian, you know, just a psychologist who is interested. And they'll stop at an object that we haven't been able to identify for the last 10, 12 years. And they'll be like, oh, I know what this is. This is because it's it'll say right on the box, unidentified. Right. And they're like, my old advisor had one of these in his lab, and this is how he used it. Right. So it's like kind of old, kind of a antiquated crowdsourcing, I guess, with these with these tours, because uh, yeah. psychologists made their own artifacts. You know, they made their own equipment. And a lot of a lot of the times there was only, you know, one or two or three of them made. Um, one of the interesting things that we have in our collection is a model of the ear that was used to uh, partially in teaching, but also partially to sort of understand how to how to do research on hearing and how to understand hearing. And I think it's the only one of its kind, right? And if I didn't have a conversation with the donor about what that thing was and how it was used for, yeah. there's no way to know. Um, but his daughter actually came through and she saw it and she told me all about it and how it was used and how it was made and how her father had made it. Uh, and so oh, so it was hand, cause I've seen those, like I, when I was an undergraduate, we had sort of commercial ones that were kind of made of plastic, but this is a handmade one. Yeah, he made but, it himself. He actually made two, he made one. And then his daughter is now a psychologist as well. 
who studies acoustics. So as a gift, he made her one too. So there are two. And it's not just a model. It actually operates in some, in some ways. So. Oh, nice. And you've got a huge film collection and this huge postcard collection. Yeah. So uh, media is um, a really important part of our collection, still images, as well as moving images. Uh, and still images come in every form you can imagine. Uh, we have photographs, we have the old glass slides. Um, I think we even have some old uh, projector, not projector slides, overhead slides. We, I think those are stored with still images. Uh, I don't know if that's where they belong, but uh, so tons of images, uh, tons of uh, moving images and just everything you can think of in terms of content. So for example, we have home movies of um, Gardner and Lois Murphy, just sort of on vacation with their family. Hmm. Uh, we have just solid experimental um, stimuli in terms of images and, and moving images. Uh, and we have a lot of footage of psychologists on TV as well, sort of serving as experts. So. Uh, the, the moving image collection, the still image collection are just really, really rich for sure. Um, yeah. And one thing I want to put in a plug for is uh, the uh, collection of popular psychology magazines that Ludie Benjamin gave you a few years ago. It's, it's vast. How many actual issues are there? Do you know? Nobody knows. I mean, again, we'd probably have to count it in feet. Uh, although most of the uh, table of contents for that are digitized now. So uh, those are available in our online database. But this collection is fantastic on so many levels. There's, again, it's this, this uh, space where psychology just so clearly connects to the public eye. Uh, so we have everything from something like uh, Psychology Today, which a lot of people will be familiar with. I think we have every issue of Psychology Today. But then we also have uh, I think that collection probably dates back to, I would guess, the late 1800s. Uh, one of the earliest um, magazines we have in there is the Phrenological Journal, which was, you know, sort of popularized phrenology. And it, you can go through every issue and sort of look at, they read uh, famous people's faces and heads and tell you all about their personalities. Phrenologists in this magazine would sell phrenology and you could sort of mail in and get your head read um, from far away or your face read with an image or a painting or something like that. Um, so yeah, again, just this real moment where you can see psychology uh, intersect with, with everyday life. Right. And, and it's something we use it very often for teaching. Yeah. We get a lot of classes that come in that aren't psychology students. So we have a sociology class that comes. We have um, gender studies classes that come. So one of the things that we did, for example, is a gender studies class came in and they looked at sort of the representation of women and mental illness in popular psychology, oh, nice. you know, using a period of time. Uh, and that collection, basically, if anybody from any field wants to come on site and do an archival project, we can find something for them in that pop site collection because it just covers so many topics in such a vast period of time. Yeah, I've looked through a little bit of it, and my, my recollection is there's this big um, kind of explosion of popular interest in psychology right after World War One, right in the 1920s and 30s. And there's a large number of magazines from that era, sort of between the wars. Um, some of them sort of what we would consider serious psychology and some of it just like, I don't know how to describe it, com completely unconnected with what we think of as disciplinary psychology these days, but still using that word, there's a certain power in the word and they all want to connect with this new discipline, which has arisen and everybody's interested in. Yeah, I think, again, I, I, I haven't seen even nearly half of the collection, but I do think that, uh, Probably more of it is not psychology than psychology, but it has psychology in the title, right? right? And not all of it does, you know, some of it'll be sort of like, I'm trying to think of the titles. It's like, I think there's one that's just called You, mm -hmm. the title of the whole magazine. Um, but it really, you know, because it purports to tell people about themselves and help them be who they want to be. And, you know, we still see all this today. Uh, we, it's considered psychology. And it's not that different from if you go to the psychology section of a bookstore today. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the same kinds of topics and things. Self-help and. Yeah, yeah. How to but make it's all listed. Work and... Yeah, yeah. And they're they're super interesting. They're not technically, uh, I mean, psychologists of the day wouldn't have considered any of these to be psychology, um, but they do sort of really help you put your finger on what, it, what everybody else probably saw as psychology, even if that's not what psychologists were, right. were selling. 
So in addition to the um, archives of the history of American psychology, now you have this Institute, Institute of Human Culture and Science. Yeah, Institute for Human Science and Culture. It's, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, it's a bit of a mouthful. So technically the Institute for Human Science and Culture was uh, came into existence, I think in 2013 um, by our, our board of trustees approved it uh, in that year, I believe. Uh, but it really just opened physically uh, in 2019. Yes. Um, the Institute for Human Science and Culture is really our space to kind of grow our collections beyond psychology and to do, it's also kind of our educational arm of the center. So there's sort of two aspects to it. One is the, the increased collections. So the major collections there is a collection of Native American um, art tools and other kinds of objects that came from a, a couple of local donors here in Akron. Um, and those are now on display in a gallery in, in the Institute for Human Science and Culture. The second sort of big collection in the Institute is a collect, well, two more, I suppose. The second one is a, a collection of bags that came from uh, a couple, uh, Howard and Elaine Foreman, who had just been collecting bags uh, kind of for their whole uh, adult lives. Like shopping bags? like. So it started out as Bloomingdale's shopping bags. Um, so Howard Foreman's first wife, Lee Foreman, uh, started collecting the original Bloomingdale's shopping bags that most people would recognize, like a brown paper bag with the Bloomingdale's um, um, on it, sort of written on it. And then it expanded into just collecting all kinds of bags. So now I think we have upwards of 10,000 bags in this collection that has now been donated to us. And there's some pretty cool stuff in there. Um, there's a bag signed by all of the Beatles. Um, there's uh, a bag, you know, I think it was Conan O'Brien used to have celebrities on his show all sit on a paper bag when they came on his show. And then afterwards they would sign it. Um, or they would sign a register saying they had sat on a paper bag. So we have con that, that bag from, from Conan O'Brien's show. Uh, right now, again, this is a collection that just offers all kinds of opportunities. Right now we have an exhibit um, up on political bags. So there's a bag from every single election going back to, I, I can't remember which one, but it's sort of, you can sort of see popular culture. On this is like presidential campaigns and their, yeah. their yeah. bags that they give yeah. their... Yeah. So it, that's a pretty cool collection. The other collection that's held up there in the Institute is the postcard collection, um, which is a really large collection of postcards that document kind of everything. So for example, we have a box of postcards representing every state in the United States. We have boxes for almost every college and university in the United States. Um, Christmas postcards, Valentine's postcards. These were donated to us by a psychologist to um, uh, David Campbell, <clears throat> who was a collector himself. And when he donated his papers to us, he also donated this postcard, postcard collection. Um, so, so the Institute has these sort of broader collections where we kind of see an interesting thing and we think we could do some cool things with this and we, we bring it into the Institute. They collect at a much... Um, slower rate than the, than the psychology archives, but they are sort of starting to have these signature collections. But the kind of, the key thing that, that makes this different is that all the collections in the Institute are there to be used for teaching and learning. Um, so currently out of the Institute, we offer a certificate, an undergraduate certificate in museum and archive studies. And the students work hands-on with all of those collections to do everything from learning how to catalog an object to uh, describing it, to getting it up into an exhibit, okay? creating uh, digital metadata for those objects. So that the students constantly work with these collections right from a single object all the way through to a full museum exhibit. Um, and that's kind of what they're there for. So whenever we talk with donors, we uh, have them know that if they're gonna donate a collection to the Institute, it's gonna get used. It's mm -hmm. not gonna put in a box and kept um, uh, out of view or kept away from people, it's gonna be used by students. So it's kind of cool. We're really, we've now got a course designation so we can offer coursework through the Institute. Um, and we're, we're starting to sort of play around with that. Uh, the key is, is finding an audience for some of the strange courses that we wanna offer. Um, but now it's kind of, you know, the sky's the limit in terms of what we can do there. We're, we're gonna start offering that same certificate at the graduate level now as well. So graduate students in public history, for example, could get a certificate in museum and archive studies through us. 
Right. So I was going to ask, so the students who come to you for this certificate, what are their, so this is on the side uh, of their normal majors. What, what are they usually majoring in when they decide they're going to get this certificate? They come from all over. I mean, we've had psych majors, we've had English majors, we've had history majors, art, um, just about everything. And some of it is, um, I think they have a side interest in this and they want to sort of figure out if this is something they want to pursue, right? Which is great because the next step basically is a MLIS, Masters of Library and Information Science. Um, so I think it's people who are in other fields, but trying to figure that out. Um, most, many of our students actually though, have gone on to work directly in museum settings right after undergrad. Uh, so I think it's something like a third of the students who have gone through the program are now working in museums or archives. Uh, yeah, which I, I will be honest, I found very surprising because it's not an easy field uh, to find a job in. Um, but, but one of the things that we do through the Institute is we really try to partner with the surrounding community in Akron. So as part of that certificate, the students go out into the community, find a partner and work in that space for a while. And I think often they end up finding kind of a permanent home for themselves through, through doing that. Right great. So, so the Institute is an interesting space, I think. Uh, I sometimes have trouble describing it to people because it's sort of um, amorphous, right? It's just, and it's always kind of changing, but it's the place where I feel like we kind of experiment with what we want to do. Uh, the university here offers something called an unclass where you don't have a syllabus. You just have a general kind of topic that you're interested in pursuing. Um, and often we'll teach courses like that through the Institute in things like digital humanities or uh, you know, we're looking at trying to do a, a class where the students create a podcast based on the psychology archives collections to give sort of stories from the stacks kinds of things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just think there's a lot of opportunity through the Institute for Teaching and Learning. Great. So, and then the third uh, division is the National Museum of Psychology, which I've been to and is spectacular. Tell us about it. Yeah, so the museum opened in 2018. Um, and it's, it's been kind of great. Prior to this museum, we did have a smaller gallery that opened in, I think, 2010. Um, and that small gallery was popular enough that we sort of decided to put forward a big fundraising effort to open the National Museum of Psychology. Uh, the museum is, it's, it's kind of, uh, we designed it in a way where it would be hopefully uh, appealing to people from a whole bunch of different audiences because we weren't really sure who would come. Um, <laughs> so I guess we kind of always knew that the museum would be appealing to psychologists mm -hmm. and to psychology students. But I, might, I should speak for myself, I suppose. I, I wasn't sure how interested the public would be in a psychology museum. So I think we pitched at a level where uh, psychologists and psychology students would find things that are interesting and familiar to them but the public would still be able to come in and uh, understand the whole thing and, and learn new things and get something out of it. And I think that really has worked out. Um, so, you know, in the museum, we tell the story of psychology as um, a profession. So things like clinical psychology, assessment, uh, psychology and advertising, that kind of stuff. We tell the story of psychology as an agent of social change. So we talk about gender, race, sexuality, um, a lot of talk in there as well about social psychology and how it's sort of changed or tried to change the social world. And we talk about psychology as a science, which is kind of the classic brass and glass, early laboratory psychology, all the way through to things like comparative psychology and stuff like that. Um, and it really is, I think the best way to describe it is as a history museum, but a history museum that focuses on psychology. And it's been, it's been good. I mean, it's been really popular. We, we definitely, our biggest audience is still psychologists and psychology students. Um, but I think that, that they get a lot out of that. And I think people can get what they want out of it. So we get a lot of psychology students who are driving through town. They will absolutely stop. Some of them will spend three hours in there reading everything, going through all the interactives and doing everything else. Others will come in, run in, take a picture with the Milgram shock generator <laughs> and then leave. Yeah. So I think there's as much there as, as people want to do in terms of how much time they want to spend. Um, you get a lot of college groups, right? From the local, yeah. a lot of colleges in, in central and eastern Ohio, and you get a lot of those groups coming in, don't you? Yeah, yeah, we do. We definitely, high school psychology classes are probably our 
our biggest visitors, high school and, and undergrad or psych high clubs, I guess, um, are probably also a big group of attenders, I would say. And uh, the, the thing that we try to do, because we do get a lot of repeat visitors now as well, especially when it comes to classes, is uh, keep, we have a rotating gallery. So everything is pretty much a permanent gallery. Uh, we're probably at the phase now where we, we need to start thinking about how we're gonna um, do sort of a do-over of the permanent gallery space sooner rather than later. Uh, but we have a, a rotating gallery space that we put new exhibits in all the time and hold events in and things like that. So we try to keep it kind of updated and, and changing all the time. Good. All right, so that's, um, that's really interesting, but let's talk a little bit about you um, <laughs> and your backstory, um, how you got to be you know, in this place you're in. Uh, where are you from originally? So I grew up in the world's smallest town in central Saskatchewan. So it's a town called Wishart population 100. Um, it was, it, it's small. It's as sm small rural as you can get. Uh, I grew up on a farm. Both my parents were farmers. Um, and, you know, we had the school I went to was one school, kindergarten through grade 12. We were the biggest graduating class that anyone had seen in about 10 years. And there was 18 of us. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, it's funny, you know, you, when you grow up in a small town, you don't know any difference, so you can't see any different, but so many strange things, you know, just in terms of the way that education worked and all of that. We shared textbooks because there was never enough, um, you know, things like boys really were not, it was not necessary that they attend school all that often because, you know, they had things to do on the farm, like really a step back in time. Uh, it sounds like. Now that I know things are a little different in others. Well, and then you went off to the big city for, for college, for university. Yeah. So I did my undergrad. Initially, I wanted to be a secretary. That was my life goal. Um, I was going to go to a tech school and be a secretary. And that was the plan as of grade 12. And then my high school principal actually was like, you should at least apply to university. Like you might like it. <laughs> So I did, um, and I got in, and I ended up going to the University of Regina. Um, so it was a couple hours away from my hometown for undergrad. I started out as an English major, and I always that was always my thing when I was uh, even in high school. I always that was my favorite class. I love to read. I love to write always. Um, so I, I I was doing that. I was doing an English degree. Um, and I actually struggled quite a bit the first couple of years of undergrad. I think because in high school, I just never really cared about school. Mm. And uh, it came relatively easy for me. I did fine, but I really didn't put any effort into it. I had a lot of fun in high school. <laughs> and then once I got to undergrad and, and uh, I think the reality of paying for, for schooling was what sort of got me to finally put some effort in. And uh, I struggled the first couple of years. I think I just put a lot of pressure on myself and I was doing great. My grades were great, um, but it, the first couple of years were definitely an adjustment. It's uh, a big adjustment for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, it really was. And it, you know, in some ways my life was still pretty comfortable. My sister and I lived together for the first couple of years of undergrad. And so I had like, you know, familiarity. I didn't struggle in those ways so much. My, some of my friends from high school were in the same city as me and things like that. It was really the academic part of it where suddenly I realized, I think I realized that I, I was kind of smart. That sounds strange, but I think I actually am capable of something here. Um, and, and I'm paying for this. So this is serious now. <laughs> Yeah. So I think it was like the first or second year I, I got like one bad grade and uh, I had a bit of a breakdown. I remember my sister kind of having to talk me out of that. Um, and then after that, it got much easier, I think. Um, so what brought the switch to psychology? Well, I, I think at some point I realized that with an, I didn't know what I was going to do with an English degree. Uh, the only thing I could think to do with an English degree was teach. And that was kind of the plan. So I was going to, I was taking English major French minor with the idea of teaching English and French. And um, I realized I really didn't want to be a teacher at some point. I didn't think I wanted to do a PhD. So I, I had been taking psychology classes and enjoying those as well. So I kind of decided I research was something that was much more suited to my personality. Um, so then I double ended up double majoring in English and psychology. Um, I think too, I just had a, a couple of really good profs in undergrad. So I 
I took a history of psychology class with uh, Bill Smythe and uh, it kind of changed everything for me. I realized it almost felt like I was able to take what I loved about, about being an English major and what I loved about psychology and bring them together. You know, so analyzing texts, this is before I had any, any notion of archival research. And I think that history of psychology felt to me like analyzing texts in the same way that I was doing as an English major. Mm. Um, except now I got to sort of bring these two things together in a new way. And, and conversely, in my English classes, I was using psychological theories like psychoanalytic theory and things like that to analyze novels and poetry. So it's being familiar. There was a familiarity. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the two were just, yeah, the two were just sort of crossing over in ways that I really, really loved. Um, and then, yeah. And then I, my undergraduate honors advisor, uh, Don Sharp was the one who really encouraged me to apply to graduate school. Again, I, I just wasn't, I wasn't sure if that was what I wanted to do. I didn't know what, again, what else to do with a psychology major. Um, so I, uh, I applied to, I think, 10 schools. Yeah, yeah tell, we, we probably have a lot of uh, undergraduate psychology students uh, viewing. So tell us about the experience. Like, how did this transpire? Uh, the application? Going, well, yeah, get, deciding you're going to go to graduate school and sort of the process you went through. It's a little different now, but there's a lot that's the same, I bet. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really interesting to me because I feel like I've always been the kind of person who just sort of goes, I'll just try it and see what happens, right? Um, and I think I also have always had a lot of self-doubt. So I think I thought, well, I'll apply and I probably won't get in. And then I'll just make another plan once that happens. Um, but I had been doing work on, uh, so my undergraduate thesis, thesis was on motivation. And I got really interested in theories of motivation, intrinsic, extrinsic motivation, things like this. And I was interested in, uh, you know, I was working at a, a bar at the time. I was bartending. And I thought about it in my everyday life too, just in terms of motivation at work. Um, and so that was what I thought I wanted to do was sort of look at motivation in workplaces um, and things like that. So I applied mostly to social personality programs. Um, I really, I only wanted to apply to the University of Saskatchewan uh, that I thought I will apply to the University of Saskatchewan. They had a good program in industrial organizational psychology um, connected to their social psych program. And my undergrad advisor was like, that's a really terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, he said, it's too close to home and you need to go away, uh, which I thought was silly at the time, but he was completely right. Um, and, and he said, you know, you might not get in and then you'll have to wait another year. So I thought about it for a while. I also was sort of toying with law school the idea of law school at the time. So I, uh, at the same time that I wrote the GRE for graduate school, I wrote the LSAT um, and did apply to a few law schools. And so my undergrad advisor gave me a low limit. He said, just 10 at least, you have to apply to at least 10 schools. Yeah. Yep. And I did. It was a lot of work. Uh, I was not prepared for the amount of work it was going to be to apply to graduate school. Um, I think I ended up getting into half of them and I, I don't, it's too long that I don't remember where I applied. Um, but I did get into the University of Saskatchewan and they actually offered me the best sort of financial package. Um, and I got into York, but not into social, which was my first choice. I got into the history and theory of psychology program. I remember. <laughs> the other place I got into that I remember is uh, Windsor. Mm -hmm which was not somewhere I was super excited about going, but there was a guy there who name I can no longer remember, who was doing exactly the kind of research I wanted to do on motivation. So that was my first choice. And I think I even accepted or tentatively accepted. And then he took a job somewhere else. <laughs> so he ended up, I think, moving to Guelph and couldn't take students at Guelph. So, uh, it was interesting because I was all set to go to Windsor and that was the way that was going to go. Um, and then I had to make another decision. But it was interesting because the reason I chose York is mostly because I wanted <laughs> to move to Toronto. Um, it's an odd thing, but I loved history. I loved history and theory of psychology. All the other programs I got into were social psych programs. Um, I loved social psych, I loved history, but 
I kind of always have felt like one of those people who, I don't know, I, I enjoy almost everything I do, which sounds a little strange. And I can, I, I get interested in almost anything that I'm doing. And I remember thinking about it going, I, I know I can get into history and theory. And I know that um, I think I'll probably even be better at it than I will be at research in terms of, you know, sort of classic lab research. And, but really at the end of the day, I remember thinking Toronto, that sounds like so much fun. I really want to go. And I thought, you know, it's only a couple of years. I, I don't have to do a PhD. I can go do a master's degree and spend two years in Toronto. And then if I hit it, I'll figure our, our American audience probably doesn't know. Toronto uh, occupies this kind of unique position in the Canadian landscape. And there's a lot of love-hate relationships. Some people find it incredibly exciting. And some people despise Toronto, would never live there in a million years. Um, so you're one of the, that sounds exciting. I'd like to go there and see what it's like. Yeah. And it was, it was absolutely a good move, you know, like it, it, it was, um, it was definitely a big move. Uh, Regina, Saskatchewan is about the whitest middle-class um, conservative place you can imagine. So you can imagine that Toronto was a completely different world for me. Uh, automatically, I realized that, but I loved it. I mean, Toronto was just it was good for me in a lot of ways. I mean, I think that history was a good choice for me. And I think that living in Toronto for, you know, the seven years that I was there was just a really great experience. Yeah. And so what was your graduate school experience like for people who've never been to it and are thinking about it? Yeah. When I moved to Toronto, I didn't know anybody at all in Toronto. Um, and I had come from a space where I'd lived my whole life uh, with all my family and all my friends around me. So it was definitely hard. The first couple of years of being there was sort of this combination of exciting and really difficult. Um, grad school is also just, it was financially hard for the first couple of years because the funding is, it, it depends, you know, it depends where you end up. But for me, I mean, the funding was difficult um, and I didn't want to work through graduate school, which is what I had done all through undergraduate and sort of sabotaged myself in a number of ways by doing that. So I just lived <laughs> sort of uh, as cheaply as I could for the first couple of years until I sort of got the knack of scholarships and things like that. Um, graduate school was wonderful and terrible at the same time. It was wonderful in the sense that I loved the, ac the academic part of it so much. I just felt like, like I was growing by leaps and bounds in the first couple of years. Like it was just, it, it's almost, it's like when you start learning a new skill, right? And in the first year or whatever of that new skill, you're just like, you're always getting better, always getting better. And that's how graduate school always felt. Um, and there's nothing better than being able to spend all day, every day immersed in whatever you're thinking about. It's the only time you get to do that, right? I, I, I didn't get to do that in undergrad. Um, I've not gotten to do that since. No, it's a special time. It's true. People think that your entire career as a professor, for instance, is going to be like that. And it, it's not. It's graduate school allows you to focus in a way that it's very hard to do at any other time in your life. Yeah. And in that first couple of years, it's really good because later, you know, once I got into my PhD, I, I was almost specializing more, right? And especially once your coursework starts to wind down and, and you actually have less interactions with people, I think, as you get through, through, depending how you handle it. But once you get into dissertation writing or, or things like that, you just, you have less time with other students. So those first couple of years, like the master's, it's really, really good because you're taking coursework that maybe you, you wouldn't choose, you know? So at the, at the same time, I'm taking um, you know, statistics, my first graduate level history of psychology class, and, you know, maybe a social psychology class. And they're so much more in depth than they ever were in undergrad. And you start to make connections that you wouldn't make otherwise in these very different kinds of classes, talking to very different kinds of people. Um, and then you go home and you think some more. Right. So what was your dissertation on? Uh, my master's, my master's thesis or my dissertation? Either one or both. Uh, my master's thesis was very much like a, a strange continuation of text analysis. So it was on um, sort of the origins of American social psychology as they came out of uh, French sociology. Specifically, I was kind of interested in individualistic versus collectivist ideas of the social uh, around the turn of the century, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, when I moved into my dissertation, I had gotten much more interested in archival research. Um, 
And so I focused more on American social psychology and looking at the work of Floyd Allport, who's considered to be kind of the founder uh, by some people of American social psychology. So that was uh, kind of my first real in-depth experience doing archival research, which was um, a whole new, it was, it was almost like a whole new discipline compared to what I had done for my master's thesis. Uh, and it was, again, I can see the switch for myself from the master's thesis to the doctoral dissertation of thinking about history differently, right? Um, in terms of it not being necessarily a history of ideas, but actual people living in actual places, experiencing the world and creating a psychology that meshes with their view of the world. We had to spend a lot of time in the Syracuse archives. as I Right, remember. yeah, Which yeah, is, so. Uh, um, kind of yeah, and it's it was interesting because those archives are very, uh, thorough. I mean, they, all port saved everything, which sort of makes makes a historian's job both wonderful and terrible because you have to go through all of the use, useless stuff to also get to the good stuff. Um, uh, but it was it was a really good experience. I mean, I think that it was also a good experience to understand how you can change your mind as a historian. How sort of your own idea of the story doesn't have to be built. Um, from the get-go and you just sort of go where the information takes you. Um, I, I really did enjoy, as much as, as terrible as writing a dissertation is, I, I did also, um, I really enjoyed the research. I think putting it together was the part that, of course, is, is definitely the hardest. Um, my own experience was strange too because I finished all my coursework and, and all of that and uh, did it in a way where I thought it would be best to finish all my coursework, get all that out of the way, and then write my dissertation. In retrospect, I don't think that was the best idea. Mm -hmm. I don't think that sort of isolating yourself and just trying to write is a good idea. Um, some people will say it is, and, and I think it works for some people. I think myself, I would have been better off to sort of be writing and doing other things at the same time. Uh, because I think that otherwise, it, for me, it felt like too much pressure. Yeah. Uh, to just be writing and not doing anything else. And, and somewhere towards the end, I, I can't remember anymore where I was exactly in my career, but uh, a job, this job at the center came up as a yeah, so How did you go from Toronto to Akron? That's a big move. Yeah, I, I was kind of already starting to think about applying for jobs. Actually, I did. Apply, I forgot. I did actually apply for a few uh, faculty positions. In addition, I had started my dissertation. I think I was like one chapter into what would be a five or seven chapter dissertation. And I was done my coursework and all the other requirements. So I started thinking about applying for jobs. And I applied to a few faculty positions. I don't think very many, maybe three it, it was, it, I was, I knew that it was going to be hard to find a job as a historian of psychology, um, but I was still surprised when I started looking at the job market, how few faculty positions there were um, for generalists, which is sort of what I was looking at, and actually is what I've always considered myself to be more of a generalist than a specialist. Um, there were very few jobs out there. Mm -hmm. That I felt like I, I could even sort of, you know, weasel my way in and sort of make the case that I would be uh, a good fit for the job. Uh, but around that time, it was just really wonderful to see a job come up here at the center asking for a temporary assistant director um, for the coming at the time it was uh, called the Archives of the History of American Psychology. Basically, what was happening was our former director, David Baker, was serving as provost of the university, and he had asked for someone to come serve as, as an assistant director while he was in that position. So I applied for that job. Um, and my understanding really is one of the things that I has surprised me and still continues to surprise me as I continue on is, is how much word of mouth matters for everything. Uh, I think I mostly got this job uh, by recommendations. Um, you know, I have I have a good, I had a good CV. I had publications and grants and things like that. That definitely helped too. But um, the world of academia is, is so much smaller, I, <laughs> I think, than anyone ever realizes. Uh, and kind of a lot of the good things that have come my way have come uh, through word of, through sort of recommendations from other people. So, um, yeah, I, I got this job and. 
real, and I'm not sure I expected to, and I kind of realized pretty quickly that I, I needed to take it because it was just opportunity. So that, so I, that was in 2009 and, and I've been here ever since after the two year sort of contract was up, we managed to continue to find ways to get the university to renew that contract until, um, and that's kind of the, the situation we've been in until this year when Dr. Baker retired and I took his position as director. Yeah. It's really tough the first few, first like three or four years because I was still writing my dissertation. And what I was trying to do, we had made an agreement when I started this job that I would take Fridays to write. <laughs> you also can't write <laughs> that way. It just doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, it comes, you write, you write Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, by the time you get around to Friday again, you have no idea where your head was. Um, and you have to go back and reread everything you read last weekend. And so eventually what I did was just took a whole bunch of time off and wrote a dissertation. Um, I find that when I write too, that I, I, I have, I need these, it's not like I can do it one day a week. You need to, I need these concentrated periods of time where I kind of get all the ideas in my head all at the same time. And, and then I can churn out 10 or 20 pages and then I can take a break and then I come back and I do the same thing, but I need a week or two or, you know, a certain amount of time to sort of gather it all together before I can really, um, really do a good job on the writing. Yeah, I think it's integral to writing um, and, it, and really important for being able to I don't know, just synthesize information, right? So you're reading all these different things. And if you're reading them too far apart, you can't kind of synthesize that and turn it into something great in the way that you can when you're sort of doing it back to back all along. So, I mean, that that's the thing that I think I learned for sure with that is anytime I'm, if I'm gonna do a writing project I now, it's very difficult for me to do, but I'll, I'll, I'll only say yes if I can sort of find a space in the calendar where I can say, this is what I'm gonna do for a month straight. And yeah. I try to do this, you know, a little bit every day, or it's just not the way I write. So um, now you're sitting on this uh, pretty high perch in the uh, in the field, um, and you have a pretty good vantage point, I think, uh, to see the entire discipline kind of at once. Um, so I'd like to ask you some questions about the trends you see in in history of psychology, the discipline history of psychology today. Um, one of the things I, I think is happening now is from around 1980 or so, there was a strong push to include more women in our writing about psychology's past. And that push resulted, I think, in uh, more attention being paid to women psychologists of the past in articles and in textbooks and in other resources as well. You know, I, I should mention here, of course, Alex uh, Rutherford's um, Feminist Voices in Psychology, this fantastic website with little biographies of dozens and dozens and dozens of women in the history of psychology. And then since around maybe 2000, there has been this big press for greater international representation beyond Western Europe and North America. Um, and the outcome of that has been an influx of uh, new historians, especially I think from South America, from Brazil in particular. Um, that, that's really worked. Those two efforts have really worked. It seems to me there have been these like sporadic efforts to include more information about African Americans. Probably Robert Guthrie's uh, book, Even the Rat Was White, is sort of the, um, the the most important representative of that. But I think most people would agree that this effort hasn't been quite as successful in the history of psychology as have the efforts to recognize women and non-Euro Americans. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually less positive about how far we've come in terms of uh, the representation of women in the history of psychology, as well as sort of international psychologies. I still feel like one of the biggest difficulties in history of psychology is, is that is sort of, you know, this gray box phenomenon, right? So if we, if we're talking about the history of women in psychology, it's sort of this, this, uh, it's how women have contributed to psychology, but they're never inside any other narrative to some extent, or international psychologies are never inside any other narrative. It's almost like, I still feel like these things feel like side stories. Um, 
So they're not part of the mainstream still that they're at. right. Like I feel like we still have a standard story when it comes to history of psychology. And, and that's the big issue is that we, we just shouldn't have, a, we, we can't have a standard story anymore. It doesn't make any sense to have a standard story. And why is that? Cause it's too complex. It's too much of a network that you. Yeah. I think the standard story served a lot of uh, purposes and it also makes it a lot easier to teach history of psychology and to explain history of psychology and things like this. Uh, but I think as we're starting to see in, in our journals and in other spaces, the standard story is, is not, it, just, it doesn't even seem logical to me anymore to sort of tell the story of how psychology grew out of laboratories and, and so on and so forth into the space that we have it now. So I feel like Although we're seeing, you know, the stories of women psychologists and in international psychologies and in journals, they feel like gray boxes to me still. And it might just be me. It might just be the, the, the space that I'm sitting in. What do you mean by a gray box? Like, what do you? Like something that it, that is that is just um, like there's borders around it. And no one knows where to put it. Right. Okay. It's sort of like um, somebody. So if if a psychologist is reading the history of psychology journal. Uh, they'll read a story about, you know, women in the history of psychology. And they'll kind of go, oh, that's interesting. I never knew that. But it doesn't get integrated into their knowledge of psychology's history or psychology as a field. It's sort of an interesting story. And that's changing to some extent, I think, uh, especially when it comes to women in psychology. But I still think somehow it needs to be integrated in a bigger way into the ways that we think about history of psychology. Right. Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, we seem to be in this kind of special moment right now, um, partly because of the Black Lives Matter protests, these huge protests in the U.S. particularly, but all over the world, really. It all sort of came together at the same time that we're over the past summer and, and the early fall. And I wonder whether you think that's going to have an impact on not just psychology more broadly, but on history of psychology. Like, is there a way to take that energy and uh, use it to infuse the the discipline in a way to activate, to energize the discipline to these issues um, in a way that they hadn't been before. Yeah. And I think actually it's interesting because I, I do feel like this is a completely different moment for historians of psychology, at least in, in my in my experience, right? Things may have looked like this. I get a sense that maybe the, the early or the mid-1960s late 1960s, early 1970s, there might have been a similar feeling in history of psychology as it was just getting started, right? But I think that right now there's this notion that history of psychology can do some good um, for the larger discipline of psychology, which is something we've been moving away from. Uh, my sense is that we have kind of, we, we've started to see ourselves more as historians and less as psychologists. Uh, and that's okay. I think that that's, that's good in a lot of ways, but I, I feel like in this past year in 2020, there's been kind of a reinvigoration of this idea that we are also psychologists and that the history of psychology can serve the field of psychology and psychology's publics. Um, and I think some of that is, is related to the Black Lives Matter movement and all of the things that we've seen, right? So History is a real opportunity here to kind of help psychologists understand how we got to where we are, right? So I think there's some reckoning going on within the discipline in terms of understanding, um, you know, what psychologists themselves have done that has made them complicit in sort of this long story of racism. And history is a, re history is a really good way to do that, right? To understand how psychologists got where they are and and how they've, how they've been a part of this narrative. So I think that's what I would like to see come out of this year is for us to think about how to use history to address racism, um, to think about it from multiple levels, right? So things like there are no, there are so few black historians of psychology. It's true. Um, there is, there's, so little recognition of women of color in the history of psychology. Um, if you ask students to name women of color in the history of psychology, most of them can't. <clears throat> I would guess that most psychologists can't name very many women from the history of psychology who are women of color. Uh, maybe, maybe Mamie Phipps Clark. Yeah. 
Um, so I think that there's a real opportunity for historians to be a voice here and, and to sort of do history that not just highlights contributions of people from the black community, because I think that we do need to do that as well. That's important. And, and I've done some of that myself, but to actually do critical history that looks at how psychology has been complicit in, in sort of the racist history of our field. Right. That, you know, I think the, the American Psychological Association is starting to do some looking into their own institutional structure and so on and so forth. And, and uh, the way in which psychological research has treated um, people in the black community and other, other kinds of groups. And I think that this is exactly the kind of thing that history can do. So it's not necessarily just tracing the history of how we got there, but sort of looking at other moments in history when we made these kinds of choices, mm -hmm. right? For example, if, if we look at the eugenics movement, we're looking at it not necessarily just to tell the history of the eugenics movement, but also to sort of understand like, how did that happen? How, and, and, and what were the choice points? And, and how can we sort of understand what those look like right now? Um, similarly, I, I was teaching this year and I was, we were talking about the Tuskegee study, right? And we use that as a space to, to think about the ways in which the APA is right now um, reforming their ethics code, right? So sort of, again, looking at how, what kinds of moral principles were being used uh, in these early studies and thinking about ethics from that perspective and then looking at the ways in which we're rethinking the ethical code right now. Um, and, and, and looking again at the studies that were done after Tuskegee in psychology with the black community. Uh, how, you know, sort of studies of black housing, uh, studies of black communities that, that um, you know, really what they were doing is, is trying to advance research rather than trying to help the community. You know, the goal of actually improving the community, if you sort of look at it now, was never the goal. And that's important because we can look at research that's being done now by white researchers in black communities and go, okay, are we making these same kinds of moves right now? And the answer is, Sometimes, yes. Right. So understanding how psychology pursued these topics in the past can uh, give us information, can be a warning to us or, or give us a new perspective on how the things we're doing now may play out in the next you know, years or decades. Right. And it's not necessarily about predicting the future, right? Or, or seeing how, um, how the past, it's not that the past is repeating itself, right? It's that these things are still there. The assumptions that we made in, you know, research that we were doing in the 1950s are the same assumptions we're making now. Um, it, it's really not about predicting the future or, because everything is so different than it was then. But research, the models that we use for research are really not that different than they were um, 50 years ago or, or even maybe 70 years ago in some cases. And then it gives us a space to sort of think about you know, so people are trained now in multicultural competency when it comes to um, practice, and there's some of that for research as well. But if we actually understand the assumptions that were being made then and sort of the choice points that people took, maybe those trainings look different. Mm -hmm. Maybe we, we make changes in contemporary psychology based on what we've done in the past. And this requires a bit of a pivot for us, though. I think that when historians of psychology started out, they held on to their identity as, as psychologists pretty tightly. And somewhere along the way, we've moved further away from that. And I think that's good. I think it made us better historians. Um, I think that, and I think that it, it brought in people from outside the field to do history of psychology, which is really important because it has to happen on both those levels. Telling, you know, sort of exploring history to understand the story is absolutely important. Um, but that other part of this is really important. We are, a lot of us are still really interested in what the history of psychology means for contemporary psychology, mm -hmm. and for psychology as a field. Um, I definitely am. I, I, I've sort of gone down the other path too, I think. I think there was a while where I kind of distanced my psychologist identity. Um, and uh, that's changing for me. And I think part of that is being here uh, at the center and, and having so much interaction with psychologists and understanding what they take away from history and what history means to them. Um, I'm spending a lot of time at APA. You know, I've been uh, sort of involved with APA pretty heavily for a number of years now. And I, I, 
my historian hat is always on and I just, I watch things unfold at APA and I think about how, how much history could help understand what's happening there all the time. Uh, I was sitting on the Council of Representatives when the Hoffman report was was sort of coming down the lines and and the whole discipline. to tell our audience what the Hoffman report is for this. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I feel comfortable doing that. <laughs> Let me try. I, there were a couple of psychologists who were involved in uh, the uh, torture that took place in the dark sites and at Guantanamo Bay in the wake of 9-11. And um, the APA executive was um, reluctant to condemn that. And there was a referendum of the membership that said we should not be doing these things, not be involved in these things. And the association was at, let, at least slow to implement those uh, changes that had been mandated by the community. And eventually um, some lawyers were hired, Hoffman and uh, uh, Hoffman and some lawyers were hired to write a report about what had happened and how things had gone wrong. And that report was quite controversial, um, was quite a sort of a bomb that was dropped in the middle of APA. And we're still trying to figure out how to change the association in line with Hoffman's recommendations. Does that sum it up adequately for you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the thing that was so interesting to me about that when I was sitting on council, uh, council kind of, um, I mean, everything was uh, was just kind of a disaster on council during all of that. Uh, we had trouble holding meetings that had any meaning because everybody was so confrontational um, and there was just so much disagreement. And at one point, the APA hired an anthropologist to come observe council meetings to try to understand um, sort of the history of how we had gotten to where we were and, and sort of how council operated as it operated and all this kind of stuff. And, and I remember thinking a historian of psychology should be here. This should not, there should not be an anthropologist in this room. Uh, what you need is a historian of psychology to sort of look at the ways in which the sort of ethical quandaries of psychology have unfolded over time. Mm -hmm. And, and how the discipline has been sort of split apart by that in a myriad of ways. Uh, a lot of that to me just looked like the discipline has been hanging on together as one thing by small threads for so long. So you think there was like a clash of kind of tacit agendas and assumptions? Nobody yeah. really talked about them. We all said, oh, we're all psychologists, but we came to this point and suddenly all that came into view and people began to realize that other people in the same discipline believed very different things from what they believed? Believed very different things and had very different goals, right? So the military psychology division has very different goals from, you know, the psychoanalysis division, uh, who has very different goals from historians of psychology and, and all these other kinds of people. And it just felt like, you know, a long time ago, um, Sigmund Koch talked about whether we should be psychology or whether we should be renamed the psychological studies. And I'm sitting in this in this council room thinking, man, Sigmund Koch would have a lot to say about what's happening here, right? <laughs> but instead we've hired an anthropologist to tell us about what's, what's gone wrong and what's going on, right? So that's where I think that, that historians of psychology, I really hope we always maintain some kind of strong tie to the field because I don't know, I don't know how our voices be, become more or how mainstream psychologists understand better what historians have to offer. But I think that there is just a lot that we can do. Um, but I, I think to some extent, a lot of us have gone back to just doing standard history because it, it feels more fruitful. And, and in some ways it is. And for some people, that's their interest. And I, th I think that's great. But just I would love to see by the end of my career, historians having sort of a central role in a lot of these discussions, because I think they they know more. They know more than most people at those tables do in terms of what's actually happening. All right. Well, that sounds like a really good place to wrap it up. Um, thank you so much for all this time. Um, I'm really glad that you were able to spend this time with us. Thanks, Chris. So that's all there is for our second show. I want to uh, thank Kathy Fay of the Cummings Center for the History of Psychology for being our guest and spending time with us. And um, I uh, hope you will come and join us for the next History of Psychology show. I'm Christopher Green from York University in Toronto, Canada. <laughs>